Welcome to the CodeCast Podcast. Real-world insights for your daily medical coding and billing processes. And now, here's your host, Terry Fletcher. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the CodeCast Podcast today. My name is Terry Fletcher. We are at episode 76, and we have finally hit April. So let's hope that the warm weather is headed our direction. So today I wanted to talk to you first about, I was actually going to go into something called concierge and direct primary care medicine, but I'm going to save that for a later date because we have some breaking news. And yes, we are back to the American Medical Association final ruling uh, from the AMA editorial panel, and they have now made some uh, specific changes to what's going to happen in 2021 for evaluation and management or what we like to call E&M coding. So I know some of you are like, well, that's years away. It really isn't. If you look at the calendar, 2021 is 20 months away. That's all it is. And so it's, it, you know, that's a year and eight months when you think of planning and understanding the changes that really need to start now. And then you get into learning the new rules. And that would probably be later this year. And then updating your templates in your electronic medical record system. And then training, not just your staff, but your physicians. And then also your internal staff if you're doing any kind of um, auditing yourself. So this is coming sooner rather than later. And also remember ICD-11, which is the next step up from ICD-10 diagnosis coding, that comes into effect January 1st, 2022. So just a year later. So you really have to, as I like to call, we need to get our house in order and understand what it is that we need to prepare for. Because sometimes it just comes in so fast, it smacks us right in the face. And time flies in healthcare. So we want to really get started and take a look at what was finalized this week. Now, I, you know, when I-10 came out, I know a lot of people were like, oh, it's never going to take place. It's never going to happen. And it actually was delayed several years. But there is such a push to change the e guidelines at this point. And in, as you know, I'm an auditor. So I'm still auditing on 95 and 97 guidelines for 2019. I'm going to still be doing that for 2020. We had a little bit of a, a tweak for 2019 that I'll head into next year as well. But the scary thing here, or I should say, I don't want to, I don't want to scare you. So that was probably a bad choice of words. The thing that here that you need to really understand is that when I gave you breaking news last year of what the proposal was for 2000 and what was going to be for 2019, but they pushed it to 2021 for the ENM services, you know, it was such an overhaul, but it only was of the office and other outpatient services. So what we do in the office setting. But the AMA CPT editorial panel decided, you know what, let's just overhaul the entire documentation guidelines. So it's not just going to be office, it's going to be any place of service that we're using certain codes. So I'm going to get into this and we're going to take a look at what the final ruling was. And I also want you to make sure that you, you listen carefully because there's a lot of inaccurate information out there. And so let's let's not get caught up into what you think is accurate. This is what is absolutely accurate from, and I'll give you some references, on exactly what the panel said. I was on the call, made sure I took notes, listened carefully. This is going to be a huge rollout, so we want to get started on the right foot. But first, CodeCast Podcast is brought to you by Simple Health Radio. Join Dr. Amran each week on his radio podcast to discuss current health topics, simplehealthradio.com in Houston, Texas. Okay, so what is going on with the breaking news? So AMA is on track to revise the ENM codes, and then the, you know, the code set new documentation guidelines. And what was considered first to only target the office and other outpatient visits now has been expanded to impact the entire ENM section of CPT. So we weren't prepared for that. We were sitting there saying, well, it's going to be tough because we're going to have to do one thing in the office and outpatient setting and then something else in the hospital or skilled nursing and so forth. But now they're saying, well, okay, you guys complained about it. So now we're going to overhaul the entire CPT uh, evaluation management 
guidelines. So now we're just like, great. So let me explain how this works. So the AMA CPT editorial panel, they approved many changes to the ENM documentation and coding guidelines. If finalized, so it's approved and now it has to go through a finalization a protocol, not just with AMA, but also Medicare. They always have a big voice in everything. The changes will shift the way medical practices are going to select their codes, both in the office and also facility visits as soon as January 1st, 2021. So here's what was approved. And then I'll kind of explain as we go. So there is going to be a deletion of the level one office new patient visit. So the 99201. Uh, for Medicare, claims for code 99201 represented only uh, 0.15% of all 266 million outpatient claims in 2017. So, and it had a 37% denial rate versus an overall ENM denial rate of about 8%. Okay, so that's why they're saying this code is really inappropriate. The thing is, is that the 201 has a place, but so many offices used it for the wrong thing. So it's a quick check of a new patient, which almost always the patients can get up to a level two based on the guidelines. So they are deleting the level one new patient office visit. And then understand the history and exam change before you proceed training on the new guidelines. I heard this twice, not just at a different uh, webinar, but also um, from a speaker who was talking on this. And I had to pull them back and say, that's not accurate. You need to rephrase how you're saying it. So listen carefully to the history and exam change. So AMA's panel agreed that to remove the history and exam as key components for selection of the ENM level of service. So what that means is that the history and exam would not be used to score a visit for an audit. So you're not going to have to count bullets. You're not going to have to count how many review of systems, HPI elements, um, anything like that, past family social history. However, and this is what's really important to understand, the provider would still be required to document these elements that they were performed in order to report the office visit code at all. So you still have to do a history and an exam, and it should be part of the documented record. It's just not going to be used with scoring. So I like to kind of um, relate this, and this is okay, this is kind of a stretch when I'm, how I'm kind of relating this and, and giving you kind of a cross walk over to it. So there's a service called moderate sedation and moderate sedation is when a physician is supervising a patient who is getting, uh, let's say like Versed or fentanyl or Benadryl for a minor procedure. Well, of that mo a moderate sedation, there is uh, interest service time, which is the only time that you can count for your total supervision time for the physician to be able to code for supervising uh, this moderate sedation administration. But there's also pre-service time and post-service time that's required. And the pre-service time basically is the HMP, how did the patient um, you know, do in their physical, being able to tolerate the medication? Is there any interactions? Was there any issues with, you know, breathing, lungs, all that? So that's usually done by a nurse and the doctor signs off on it. Then there's inter-service time, which is when the doctor's face-to-face -face and they're in there supervising and performing their procedure. And then they will say if they need more or less of the drug. And then the patient then is brought out, which is the post-service time or post-service work, they call it. And then the patient's brought out of the drug and they're slowly coming to basically, it doesn't put them to sleep, but it does make them so lucid that they may not remember a lot of what happened. Well, in that pre-service time and that post-service time, that's not counted, even though required as far as time. And so, and you only get paid in 15 minute increments. Okay, so that's back to the e &M, uh, information with regard to history and physical. So the history and exam still has to be done and they're still going to require the 95 or 97 guidelines, but it's not used in scoring. So you still have to have a problem pertinent history exam because think of a record. And this is what I was hearing out there is, oh, you don't have to do a history and exam anymore. And I'm thinking, are you kidding? Stop telling people that. Because if you've got a, a patient with complex issues and you don't do a history or document a history, how do you know what medicines they're taking? How do you know if there's any family history of cancer or 
you know, other things, diabetes, hypertension, any complex issues that could be contributory to why they're being seen today. If you don't do an exam, I mean, you're not even touching the patient. So how do you know what's going on with that patient? So it still has to be done. It's just not used in scoring. Okay, so keep that in mind. Physicians would select the ENM code based on either one, the level of medical decision making, which actually is going to be revised a little bit, and I'll show you how in a minute, or two, the total time spent performing the service on the day of the encounter. And then time will limit you on how many patients you can see, but they're now also going to have some extra time codes and then time of the entire visit that may not always be completely face to face. So one of the things I've noticed through this entire process is that the AMA and Medicare seem to think that doctors want to spend an hour with their patients. I'm not finding that to be the case. I'm finding that they want to have the paperwork reduced, but it's so they can see more patients. So when I see all of these different things as far as choosing levels of service based on time, right now that's a default. If you spend more than 50% of the time of the total time of the visit, counseling or coordination of care with the patient, then you can use time as your deciding factor. But as we get into some of these new guidelines, I'm looking at all these time elements and I'm thinking, well, okay, I, we appreciate that you're trying to cut down the paperwork, but if it's to spend more time with the same patient and the same amount of money, that's where it's going to be tricky because Yes, they're going to raise the uh, reimbursement slightly, but enough to make up for four patients in an hour versus one, not a chance. So this is where you're going to have to really figure out how you're going to choose your level of service for the patient. So the plan is to revise the ENM guidelines into three sections, common to all ENM services, guidelines specific to office and other outpatient visits, and then guidelines specific to ENM services in the facility setting, including observation, hospital inpatient, consultations, ER department, nursing facility, domiciliary, rest home and, or custodial care, and then home setting. Total time would include total time spent on the date of the encounter instead of total face-to-face -face time. So let's say the patient leaves and the doctor still needs to talk to another physician to help coordinate some care for that patient. And again, it's the physician or the mid-level that's billing directly to the payer, then that time could be included in what the physician uh, is they're picking based on time. But there's still a lot of nuance here that I can say, well, I can see where some office is going to say, well, what if, what if, what if, and I'm, I also have questions. So again, these are the, the finalization stages, but this is what's been approved so far. The number of diagnoses or management options in the medical decision making, that's going to change to number and complexity of problems addressed. So they have decided to change that a little bit. And so that's part of the overhaul of the total uh, medical decision making portion. Also amount and complexity of data to be reviewed. This would become amount and or complexity of data to be reviewed and analyzed. And then the risk of complication and or morbidity or mortality. This now becomes risk of complications and or morbidity or mortality of patient management. So some of that is going to be tightened up to be able to choose a service a little bit easier on if you're picking based on uh, medical decision making. Also among the additional proposed changes, these were not finalized yet, but these are proposed. Prolonged services, so right now the 99354 and 99355, an additional 30 to 74 minutes above and beyond the typical time spent with the ENM code right now. These are going to change to say, because now they say in office or other outpatient, they're going to exclude them from reporting of office or other outpatient because now a new code, another 99 code for prolonged care is going to be added to report prolonged office or their outpatient e &M service. It's going to be a generic code uh, for that extra time. But again, listen to this. This is based on time. So now if we're adding another code, we're probably now at an hour 15, an hour 30 for a patient. And so it, it's just, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm just looking at this time and thinking, I just don't know if the doctors are going to buy into this as a whole. And then an interesting inclusion AMA proposes to add guidelines for reporting time, quote, when more than one individual performs distinct parts of the e &M service. So I want them to clarify, and I asked this on the call, but they were ready to end, so they didn't get to it yet. But this would need to be clarified as to what constitute the cl constitutes the clinical team as part of the encounter. 
because they quoted and said, when one individual, okay, well, who is that? Does that mean when the scheduler comes in and also talks to the patient about scheduling their surgery or when the medical assistant comes in, when the nurse comes in, who is this other individual? Is it a clinical person, an administrative person? I don't want to guess and I don't want any assumptions made on what this could be. So we have put that out there to AMA and said, please clarify as to what that constitutes this individual. Also, there is a summary changes where you can uh, see the different sets of guidelines as well, the new definition of terms, new medical decision making table, uh, and definitions of total time associated with the outpatient codes. Make sure that you go to the AMA website and you have to sign in as a member to see it. Um, to be able to to view it. So if you're not a member, you're basically kind of holding yourself out to dry there. Hopefully, a physician practice, your physician does have a membership for any of that. So that is the breaking news. And I know it's coming into effect, you know, 2021. But think about that. Everything we know now about coding is going to be overhauled and changed. They say they're only keeping about 25% of what we know now. So I don't know about you, but as much as I really appreciate the ICD-10, you know, manual and how specific it is, in ICD-9, I was, I was using for what, 30 years. So now all of a sudden we had something different come into play in 15. And now we're actually going to be even dealing with ICD-11. So they're constantly revising and updating. And uh, we'll see how this works. We'll see exactly what happens with that. So I want to take a minute for my coding question. And this week, my coding question is orthopedic from one of my Kansas subscribers. And it says, Terry, we have the notes indicate that the orthopedist performed an elbow x-ray examination along with a two view forearm x-ray. I'm not sure about the elbow x-ray code because I see that in the descriptor, some elbow x-ray codes include arthrography. What is arthrography and how should I code this encounter? Okay, so just a little bit of a, a coding uh, knowledge here. So coding is easy enough for the at forearm x-ray. So on the claim, uh, you're going to report this 73090, and that's the radiological examination forearm two views. As for the elbow x-ray, that's a little trickier. You'll choose from one of the following x-ray codes depending on the encounter specifics. So 73070 would be radiological examination elbow two views, 73080 is radiological examination, so x-ray basically, a complete minimum of three views. And then 73085, that's the x-ray elbow arthrography, radiological supervision interpretation. So what an arthrography is, it's a type of imaging test used to look at a joint, such as a shoulder, knee, or hip. It may be done if standard x-rays do not show the need, uh, needed details of the joint and structure and function. So during an arthrography, a long thin needle is used to put contrast dye into the joint and a series of x-rays is taken with the joint in various positions. X-rays use small amount of radiation to get pictures of the inside of the body and sometimes air is used as the contrast substance when regular contrast cannot be used. Okay, so you want to look for that needle injection with contrast for any arthrography x-ray. This week, I'm actually going to do two questions because this came in from uh, another one of my clients, a Coding Corner client, and I thought this was a, an important time to do this. Also, because I've had a specific client of mine ask to do some training videos for them, which I appreciate. And so one of the topics was critical care. So I thought we'd get our feet wet in that real quick. So the question comes in from one of my West Virginia subscribers, and it says, Terry, I'm new to coding. Can you help me understand what constitutes as critical care? Also, I once read that there is a specific list of services bundled or included into the 99291 code, but I don't remember what they are. Can you clarify for me? So critical care codes, 99291, critical care, evaluation and management of a critically ill or critically injured patient, 30 to 74 minutes, or and 99292, that's each additional 30 minutes above and beyond the first code. This occurs when a physician or other qualified healthcare professional directly provides medical services for a critically ill or critically injured patient. So as always, the documentation must support the medical necessity of the critical care service. And to qualify for critical care, here are your requirements that need to be met. So the patient must be critically ill or injured, have vital organ failure or a life-threatening condition. 
Number two, the physician must perform the critical care services, including using high complexity decision making to assess, manipulate, and support vital system function and to treat vital organ system failures or to prevent further life threatening conditions. And that has to be well documented. And then all critical care services must at least have 30 minutes on a given date of service well documented. The time can be continuous or intermittent, but for any given period of time the physician spends providing critical care services for a patient, they cannot provide services to any other patient during that same period of time. And you cannot report the time the physician spends in activities that occur outside the unit or off the floor as critical because the physician is not immediately available to the patient. You also cannot report time spent in activities that do not directly contribute to the treatment of the patient's critical state at that time, even if they're in the critical care unit. So the doctor has to be pretty specific. Now you asked what were the uh, specific lists of services that were included in the 99291 code. The interpretation of any cardiac output measurements, pulse oximetry, chest x-rays, uh, gastric intubation, uh, temporary pacing for transcutaneous pacing, uh, vent management, and vascular access for procedures. Those are all part of critical care. It happens very fast, and if the physician is trying to stabilize a patient so that they don't die, that's really what critical care is. Patient codes, patient goes into failure, patient goes into distress, you know, anything like that, that's when you get into uh, critical care. And make sure that you have time documented because this can be a, a hugely complex patient. They're in a critical state. Doctor doesn't give you time. You have to default back to the highest level E&M service for an inpatient at the uh, rounding visit level, which is probably going to be 99233. So make sure time is documented. Most One of the most important elements of critical care. Our coding question was brought to you today by Gaffey Healthcare. Better technology, better results, gaffeyhealth.com. So our new webinar schedule and seminar schedule is now posted on our website. I mentioned that last week as well. You can see it at terryfletcher.net. Um, go to our uh, services and you can go down to the, I think they're the second or third choice and you will see uh, live seminars, audio conferences, teleconferences and webinar. If you're interested in um, how to code for fracture care, or how to maximize your reimbursement with modifiers. Uh, if you're interested in the hierarchy codes, we have a four part series on that. Check out the schedule for second quarter because we have a lot of information there that'll help you. And we also have a promo code, Terry Tuesday, and you can get $10 off your first webinar. So I wanna end this week, and I'm actually a little bit uh, short this week, which is actually probably a good thing because everybody, it seems like is going out for spring break. And so my personal tidbit is an app that you might want to put on your phone. Now, you might have heard about it before. It's fairly new. Um, it's been out since 2015, but it's called Periscope. You might want to consider downloading it when you need a mind vacation. Sometimes your mind might just wander. You just might want to, and you don't have a chance to get up and, you know, go and be outside. But Periscope is what it, what they call live streaming. And sometimes... I just want to look at Hawaii. <laughs> That's just one of my things. And so it's not just photos like Instagram or comments like Twitter or, you know, everybody's kids doing whatever on Facebook. It's somebody that's sitting there at a beach on Oahu or on Maui or sitting in a little cafe in Italy. And it's, it's a great app because they just open up their Periscope and it's a live streaming at that time, real time. And uh, you can feel like you're there. So if it's free, if you get a chance, do it. Uh, you can follow me on there. I'm in Terry in so C A L I F, and uh, it's great because you can see all over the world uh, with this app, and you get the sounds, you get the people. So make sure you're not opening it up in your office. Um, I got to see Florida Keys in there. Somebody was walking along the Times Square in New York. Um, I've visited Italy there. So it, it's just it's just a really cool app. So if you get a chance, um, take a look at it. It's, it's a great th place to just take that couple of minutes and uh, look at the ocean if you want to, so especially for my Midwest people out there. You guys don't have ocean, so uh, take a look at that. You might like it. So until next time, everyone make it a great day, and we'll see you next week on the CodeCast podcast. Thanks for listening. For more information on medical coding, billing, auditing and compliance, including how to hire Terry, follow Terry on Twitter at TerryCoder1 or visit her website at www.
www.terryfletcher.net. Podcast producer Joe Kuzma. Music producer Assassin Music. <laughs>